Welcome, uh, Madam uh, Dr. Jaya Jaitley Ji, uh, to this conference. Uh, we are so lucky to have you, ma'am. Uh, the uh, icon of uh, a craft study in this country. Uh, your own service to the uh, craft community of uh, this country. Uh, we are all indebted in behalf of uh, Hindu society uh, for uh, your service. When uh, when we thought of actually uh, doing this conference, the first title that came to my mind actually was Vishwakarma's Children, and that was inspired by Jayaji's book by the same title, Vishwakarma's Children, because I thought just these two terms, Vishwakarma's Children, encapsulate everything that is uh, th that we are trying to do in this conference. So when we were talking about who is going to do the keynote address of this conference, I told Hariji that I want Jayaji only because uh, the idea of this conference is something that she will get. And, uh, you know, I, can, I couldn't think of anyone better than her to give the inaugural address of this conference. Jayaji is a provocator of a silent revolution in the traditional arts and crafts of India. She has inspired the Kari girls who in turn have inspired her tirelessly for decades. Even now, I live in Pune. Jayaji has a, uh, has a Dastakar exhibition going on in Pune. And I went there on the first day and I had my whole fill of, uh, you know, arts and crafts and traditions. She has worked tirelessly for decades through Dastakari Heart Samiti, and she has created viable platforms for artisans, craftsmen, and weavers, echoing the need to build a market for their work and saving the dying arts. She has worked at the Gujarat State Handloom Development Corporation, nourishing the old embroidery in Kutch in Gujarat, where stories of economic success and financial sustenance sprout amidst despair, where the craft has turned into the savior, particularly post the devastating earthquake in Kutch. In, in Kutch. It's the embroidery of uh, the embroidery skills of the women, which basically saved them from abject despair. Jaya Jaitliji's passion for cultural expressions has infused life into a number of efforts and initiatives meant to preserve and promote our cultural heritage. Her deep understanding of the community of artisans and what they need and her inherent respect for the artistic traditions as well as for the soul of the artist and the craftsman is what sets her apart from other people who have been doing this kind of work in India for a while now. She has written several books, including the Crafts Atlas of India, which I think everybody who is interested in arts and craft traditions of India should buy and keep it as a reference book. And Vishwakarma's Children, the title that, and uh, Jayaji, believe me, I had read the book and the title had stuck to my mind subconsciously. It wasn't that, you know, I was trying to get the title from your book, but when I thought of this, this uh, conference, the first thing that popped up in my mind was Vishwakarma's Children. I, I think it's thanks to you. Uh, she is, uh, these books showcase Indian arts. She has helped evolve the language of arts and crafts by blending them with other facets in her continual engagement with culture. I request Jayaji to give the inaugural address of this conference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chef Ali and Angraji before that. I don't deserve all this because I really am feeling like a child among all you scholars. Um, I've really been only a student of the craftspeople. And whatever books I've written, I haven't written from my mind or from any research from books, but from my heart. And it really comes out from their little gestures and their thoughts and the, you can say Hinduness in them. Although I must over here be fair, there are Sikhs who are doing very interesting craft. There are Muslims who have enrich the crafts with a lot of fine arts and we, as we see in Kashmir, which are being practiced now uh, in Kashmir, but not anymore in Iran. Uh, but the basic Hinduness, I feel, goes beyond any religious Hinduness. It is something which um, fills our whole universe. If we are selfless, 
and we are uh, connected, we feel connected with the universe, then there is no way we cannot accept the philosophy as practiced by our simple artisans. And um, I don't deserve to be the inaugural speaker, as Chef Ali has said, and I'm surprised you didn't meet me at the bazaar on the first day in Pune. I was sitting there fully on duty till late. And I, when Harikiran rang me up, I said, oh my gosh, my mind is going to be somewhere else. I'll be half jet lagged after staying 10 hours on duty with the craftspeople. What will I say? So he said, no, no, then he mentioned that you are referring to my book. The book also, the title came from my heart because Vishwakarma, how did I really come across the awareness of Vishwakarma? It was because I saw craftspeople on Vishwakarma Divas, just after Ganesh Chaturthi, putting down their tools and their implements and praying to them. And interestingly enough, people of every community, workers, laborers, construction workers, and especially of course, craftspeople, uh, for them, this day is extremely meaningful. It is very silent. They don't make a big noise about it, but that silence is what is beautiful. The fact that they stop work and honor what helps them to excel, to focus, to create what they are doing, for me is was one of the most important things. And as I've mentioned somewhere, it is far more important than what the West has roughly an equivalent, which they call Labor Day. Labor Day is very um, dehumanized, but the prayer to Vishwakarma and Vishwakarma Divas recognizes what Vishwakarma was or symbolizes even till today. That there was this, there is this divine skill which has created this universe. And of that, he is the architect of the gods who has, uh, whose divine spirit is really inside our craftspeople. It remains there whether they are conscious of it or not. This is what I find so interesting because through the ages, how have our crafts survived? Survived the British, survived so many droughts and storms and earthquakes and oppression, including caste oppression. How has it survived? Nagaraji was mentioning about how powders are used to create images and things are dispersed. The interesting thing which I studied uh, in my mind and also wrote a long chapter in a book called Gods Beyond Temples, that there was a time when, even today, when certain castes are not allowed inside temples. So the craftsperson, that Hindu, part of the whole pantheon of people who are in our country, and who have been recognized by the Shilpa Shastras, which was a time of great egalitarian, scientific, sophisticated thinking. They are the ones who have carried on and not worried if they were allowed in a temple or not. The beauty of their work, they did in powder, they did in mud that could dissolve. They could do it by lighting a lamp under a tree. And it's remarkable, actually, I'd like to cover a few of the thoughts on how we have made nature itself divine. And that nature today is how it is worshiped. How, if you see an artisan's paintings, never will they be without beautiful forests, beautiful plants, animals. They are all revered equally amongst us because we are, we recognize that we are part of that universe. The Shilpa Shastras have delineated the number of people including barbers and potters, anyone who is actually doing something manifesting with their hands. All those have been listed and scientifically in edicts, it is explained how it should be done. The Vastu Shastra, the Natya Shastra, everything has a specific and sophisticated direction of work. I don't think any other civilization has it in such a sophisticated manner. Perhaps over the years, all the oppression from other uh, civilizations that we've had to suffer have rubbed them off, but they don't kill them at all. They remain in the hearts and today even a non-literate craftsperson 
who does not know mathematics and measuring, that dil ka andaz, the, the, the knowledge within him, in his subconscious of how much measurement to put to get a certain color dye, dye stuff, is, is remarkable. How does he know better than a professor from Thailand who works with dye stuffs and is almost considered a national treasure over there? We have these national treasures and we ignore them because I think we don't bring them into this mainstream of respecting Hindu philosophy in its essence. And which tells us we should recognize the value of the universe, the trees, the plants, the water, the rivers, each one we attribute divinity. For instance, in a tree, Brahma is the root, Vishnu is the trunk, and Shiva are the leaves. Every god, every prominent deity has an animal who is part of the Vahan. Uh, craftspeople just now in Pune, I saw one metal worker, Dokra craftsman, had brought a lovely piece, a platform with Ganesh Ji standing like a teacher with a stick and a blackboard. And he was teaching little mice the Odia alphabet. How more beautifully can you convey divinity within the need for education? And they are conscious, they are sophisticated, they are very advanced, even if they can't sign their name in Odia or English or Hindi to convey such a depth of an idea. And this is why I dedicated my life to them because I feel they deserve that kind of respect which otherwise the world has not accorded them. And in some way, we have also denied them because from the time of the Shilpa Shastras, which was very egalitarian, which accorded a, a honorable place to every person in society, there was no difference in gender, all these, we actually made it hierarchical. And at some stage, some of those practices still continue. I do believe though that if, if I'm given this very honored position of, of uh, speaking to you at an inaugural address, to talk about the relevance for the future, because our Hindu philosophy and our Shilpa Shastras and our Vedas have taught us the value of the universe as such, universal thinking, selflessness, everybody being part of the same integral living beings. We need the sustenance of this earth, whether it is the potter or the farmer who grows the cotton for the yarn for spinning. All these people need the earth to be sustained. The block printer needs clean water. Every person who is doing any kind of dyeing of grasses needs those grasses to be replenished and to grow. Rejuvenation, recycle, reuse, regrowth is all part of the same Hindu philosophy where we talk about reincarnation. One beautiful story that nobody less than Modi ji once uh, told us in a big audience of a Swachh Bharat program, in fact, he said the Indian woman is the most conscious and most careful reuse and recycler. If you give her a sari, a new sari, she will wear it. When it wears out, she will cut it and make a baby quilt. After that, she will make it a cover for a table. Then she will, if it's even less, she will make it into a cloth to cover some vessels. And after that, finally, until it is used as a floor cloth to clean the clothes, that piece of cloth does not attain moksha. I thought that was such a beautiful example of how a woman and the whole idea of reincarnation and moksha are all intertwined and presented in a way that it is necessary to not waste, but to reuse and to make everything in life useful. These, these concepts today, when everybody is talking about climate change, I believe that this beautiful Hindu philosophy, which encompasses not just one society or one group, but the entire universe, where the rivers flow from one country into another, forests expand over national borders, these should be, which are revered by us and which need us to, need 
us and we need them to sustain life on this planet. If there is no trees, there'll be no rain and there'll be no water, there'll be no rivers. And we would all uh, be finished off as we all know. And we don't need these Greta Thunbergs to tell us that we have our practitioners among our artisans who practice this all the time. They need clean water, they need forests. Whether it is Hanumanji who goes and brings the whole forest, the whole tree hill, because he could not find the medicinal plant in the forest. From that to us naming Brindavan, the Madhuvan, one is such an important forest, a word for us because forests are sacred and forests are precious. The dance form in Kerala, the Teyam, they have 436 or so uh, forms. And in one of them, the goddess comes out to comfort people who have been affected by floods. Such sophistication of thought, no other country and no other philosophy than ours can ever offer the world. And I think um, instead of looking back also into our scriptures, since they are imbibed in the hands of our craftspeople, we must uh, respect that and recognize that and carry them along, this whole community as part of the, uh, I won't say battle, it is not a gentle word, but the movement towards preserving the planet for future generations. And for climate change, therefore, uh, there may be international conferences and big words, but just the watching the life of a practitioner of our crafts will tell you as much as what the world leaders have to learn. The beauty of also how we start is to dedicate everything we do to a higher being. In the early days, we never, never had a signature. Anonymity was what was beautiful. It was the um, offering to our deity, which was the prayer. That is itself a meditation. And even the painters, the Hindu painters who used to go and paint the interiors of Buddhist monastery, monasteries, they never signed their name. Today, in the West, the whole way of thinking is that everything is about oneself, everything is about one's brand, everything is about one's signature, and the item value may be 200 rupees, but it will become 20,000 because the person's brand is important. Everyone sells themselves. Unless we get away from this kind of thinking, and we learn from our craftspeople that they have, they get very shy when you tell them, apna naam is do. They, that beauty of that humility is something I think we need to retain and we can learn from them. Um, in their hearts and in their work, the, everything they do is for the God. Even the credit card uh, man who was at our bazaar in Pune, he would have to, he took a little ceramic Ganesh from one of the stalls, he lit his agarbatti, and he would always say a prayer before he started his work in taking the uh, customer's credit cards for swiping. And, and in another stall, uh, Chef Ali would particularly like this in the coat part stall where the weaver was there. As I was going past in the morning to see if they had had a comfortable night and they were all all right. I saw the wife putting a beautiful tikka on the husband like a blessing from the wife to the husband before the start of the day. It was such a beautiful gesture. I didn't want to spoil the mood by taking a photograph. And I felt so um, humble in front of her that she was so sweetly honoring her husband as the God. We don't, we want uh, equality, but then the woman also has to be treated like a goddess by the husband. But I thought that more than the credit card man, this uh, wife of the weaver who helps him in all the dying and all the work, um, that was such the most beautiful gesture. The little, little sparks of, the Hindu philosophy that shows up in our artisans' work, the national and international importance of what they're doing. All this is something from which we can learn. And I'm so grateful to you for organizing this conference that we can be conscious of these things and from our past, build our future. Thank you so much for calling me and I look forward to listening to some of the others a little bit. Um, thank you again. Namaste, ma'am. Namaste. Thank you so much, Jayaji, for that stirring address.
And when you talk about that, it is the Hinduness, not so much of the religious philosophy, but it is the it is the spirit uh, that's behind the crafts everywhere. And I understand that because I have seen even Muslim craftsmen from Banaras, if they if you buy something at their stall, and if you're the first person, they will tell you that boni to karo. And uh, if you want to do the credit card transaction, I have been asked by a very senior Muslim weaver from Banaras that, okay, you do the credit card transaction, but you give me that one rupee as boni. And he takes that one rupee coin and he puts it. It doesn't allow it. But the spirit is the same. It's the first Lakshmi of the day. And that is something that we have seen throughout. Doesn't matter what are the crafts and what are the craftsmen. Nagaraji spoke about the tribal craftsmen. We recently went to Chhattisgarh and saw the Dokra craft of Chhattisgarh. And most of the things that they create are actually murtis of Vishnu, murtis of Lakshmi, murtis of Shiva, murtis of Devi, and they are tribal gods and goddesses. But nowhere is this feeling that we are, you know, separated from uh, Hindu Dharma or anywhere. The craft is performed as an act of worship. And even the Bhatti has been prayed to, even the furnace before the guy actually puts the stuff, the lost wax things in the Bhatti, he actually prays to the Bhatti and this happens every single day and I think it's really remarkable that we have managed to be connected to our roots despite so many disruptions despite so many political upheavals.